Hi folks, it's Andy, the analytical preacher. You know, unfortunately, it's common. We see we see it today. We've seen it down through time. We see it, of course, with Christians as well as non-Christians. We see individuals who misuse things, who develop habits and addictions that help us cope with, or that we at least think will help us cope with the anxieties, the frustrations, the fears, the wounded pride, the rejections, the shattered expectations that unfortunately are just part of life. We immediately, of course, think about, oh, alcohol and drugs. He must be talking about alcohol and drugs are absolutely used as a way to try to cope with or soothe the wounds in our lives. But there's so many other things. There's gambling, there's shopping, there's eating disorders, there's unhealthy relationships that some people just bounce from one to the other. And then, of course, there's the topic that I really want to talk about today in this podcast, which is sex-related activities. Much like with the other things, when we begin to speak to someone, when we try to address the issue that we think maybe someone is using something, is engaged in an activity, has become habitually addicted to something because of these emotional and spiritual deficits in our lives, we tend to get back from those who aren't ready to address the problem. We tend to get back some really simple excuses for these sort of emotionally unhealthy behaviors. Well, everybody at my office drinks. It's not that big of a deal. Marijuana is really a natural growing herb. It actually has benefits to your health when it comes to bad relationships. People will say, it's not an unhealthy relationship. You don't understand the person. You don't know that person like I do. They're different in private than they are in public. You don't need to worry about me. And of course, when it comes to our topic today, people are quick to tell me, you know, God made us to be attracted to other people. God is the one who said, be fruitful and multiply by, it's implied, having sex with one another. And everybody, frankly, is not a prude like you are, and animals do it, and humans do it, and it's 2023, and frankly, you should be a little more open to how people engage in those sorts of activities. Again, I see all of those overly simplistic reasons really as just excuses for people who aren't ready to emotionally, mentally, spiritually unpack the issues that are driving those behaviors to begin with. And I had two different conversations with two different people at two different times, but that ended up being about the same topic. And it really drove home to me how badly, at least Americans, but I think it's worldwide, how badly Americans are abusing sexual activity and just how much that abuse of sexual activity is being driven by these deep-seated emotional, mental, spiritual issues. It's really being used as a cover for pain. It's being used as an escape more than it's being used as those engaged in the activities would like to make themselves believe just because it's physically fun and satisfying and enjoyable. Let me break down the two conversations really quick. The first was with a man. He was in his 40s, I'll just put it that way. He was in his 40s and he was chatting with me because he was really struggling. He was beginning to spend more and more time and more and more money at strip clubs. And he knew that it was a problem because again, the time was getting away from him, money was getting away from him, his relationships and his job and things like that were beginning to suffer a bit in addition to his bank account. So we discussed when this activity started, when he felt like it became a habit or when he felt like it got out of control, we began to discuss motivations around it, we began to discuss what it meant to him to be there, why he thought it was so magnetic, a pull for him. And he began to speak about this idea of having an experience of power and control over the women who were on the stage. And he, his Really, his voice and his demeanor changed as he got into that part of the conversation. There's really this idea of control. I'm the one in charge. He began to speak almost as if he were in that moment living out a fantasy. And as I began to pry into this and he began to open up and respond, 
he spoke about, he's able to get these women, most of whom he acknowledged were not even probably half his age. He was able to get these women to undertake these very private acts to make these most intimate displays, things that he himself said, things that they should be, I would think they would be embarrassed to do in front of me, a stranger, especially sitting beside people to them who would also be strangers. And yet he said, because he wanted them to undertake these private, intimate, even embarrassing acts and make these displays because he wanted them to do it, because he was telling them to do it, he was the one in charge. He was the one in control of the situation and he could get them to do even the most debased things at his command. Now, obviously, and the conversation quickly turned in this direction with him, obviously, when you have a desire to have, when you have a need, a desire to have that much control over another person, to exert power over another person, in a way that even you acknowledge is private and intimate and perhaps even embarrassing, it clearly suggests that something is badly unbalanced in your life. Your pride has been deeply wounded. Your expectations have been shattered. You're frustrated. You don't feel like you're getting the respect you deserve. You don't have the authority that others you think have around you. There's some type of an unhealthy relationship or multiple unhealthy relationships that have been left unaddressed in your life. It's always difficult to pinpoint quickly exactly which motivation is driving exactly which mental anguish, exactly what spiritual pain is driving each person to that habit or to that addiction, but it always falls in that area. But again, this gentleman was determined to say that men being attracted to women Men in their 40s finding nude women in their 20s attractive was natural. What he wanted to be able to do was just say, I want to be able to control the amount of time and the amount of money I'm spending there. How do you basically put a governor on it, put a leash on it? But the fact that I have hormones and the fact that they are naked is natural. And that's where the magnetic pull comes from. I suggest, of course, and suggested to him very strongly that the magnetic pull is coming from a mentally, emotionally, spiritually unbalanced and very unhealthy life. Because again, to desire that type of control, to need to exhibit on an increasingly frequent basis, that type of power over someone, and especially in a way that even you yourself admit isn't quite as natural as you're saying, but really is a bit more on the degrading end, to need to be able to do that clearly suggests that something is wrong. But society continues to tell this gentleman that it's not wrong, that it is natural for him to have that desire and for women to be employed to fulfill that desire. The exclamation point, really, for me on this topic, the the genesis of really the catalyst for this podcast, really came from the second conversation I had with someone, again, about strip clubs. This time it was a young lady who worked in a strip club. I, I say a young lady, a very young lady who worked in a strip club. Her concern was her increasing use of alcohol and drugs. But her conversation was essentially this. Everyone in her business, everyone at her club, heavily used drugs and alcohol. Legally obtained, illegally obtained. All the strippers, she said, including her, used it. And she said, the reason, because I, of course, I said, well, and why do you think that is? And the reason she said is just because it's so readily available in that environment. We're fun people. We're party girls. And it's readily available in that environment. And I said, any any possibility that, maybe not for you, but any of the young women with whom you work, that it's really a salve, that it's really a coping mechanism for deeper emotional, mental, or spiritual wounds. And it seemed almost like a novel idea to her that I could even bring up that possibility. Now, 
her desire to not use drugs and alcohol as heavily is obviously a great desire. And addictions to substances can be devilishly difficult to let go of. We spoke about, I recommended to her some local Christian recovery programs that she could participate in that were gender specific. So she could just be in the presence of females with female leaders and would have a chance to really dig into perhaps why she was such a heavy user of drugs and alcohol and ultimately be able to work herself off of drugs and alcohol. But as we continued our conversation after we spoke about these Christian recovery programs, she went in almost the exact same direction, used in fact very similar language that the gentleman had used, but from just the exact opposite perspective. She did speak, of course, about the reason she was doing the job was because of the amount of money that she could make compared to other things in which she could be employed. But she didn't speak about the money issue for long, and she didn't, to be honest, sound very convincing on the money issue as we began to have conversation. And as she got more comfortable and the conversation really began to flow, it became obvious that she had been mistreated by men in her life, one way or another, for quite some time. And and to be as young as she was, it seemed like the mistreatment had gone on for an awfully long time. It was uncles. It was neighbors. It was mom's sleepover boyfriends. It was the men that mom married that became her, she would say, quote, unquote, stepfathers. And just as it had for the man, as she began to speak about these issues, her tone changed, her demeanor changed, even her defensiveness changed a bit. And she began to speak about how the job that she was in allowed her control over her male customers. Again, almost the exact phrase that he had used. When I'm dancing, she says, I get the power back. I get the control back. I'm not worried about men hurting me anymore. I'm not worried about men rejecting me anymore. I'm the one calling the shots, she said. I tower over them on the stage. They never reject me. They're locked in on my every move. And they give me their money. It would be impossible to have had those two conversations, even eight years apart. It would have been impossible to have had those two conversations and not come to the conclusion of how sad a state we are in today related to sexual activity. Both of these individuals go to that place, one on stage, one at a table below the stage, and each goes there desperately trying to cover the deep emotional, mental, and spiritual caverns of pain that exist in them by gaining some superficial momentary control over the other. Absolutely sad and devastating that that is where these two individuals were at. It was obvious that just barely below the surface for both of these two individuals was a tremendous amount of pain and incredible frustration with where they were at in their life. And it wasn't the drugs or the alcohol use. And it wasn't the amount of money that this gentleman was spending at these clubs that was the real issue, obviously. But yet they were very reluctant. They were very unwilling to acknowledge that the sexual activity part was as unhealthy as it obviously is. Both would talk about, we live in a sexually liberal society. We have sexual freedom today. And they claim we fought hard for that freedom. And we had to fight the Supreme Court for that freedom. And only old-fashioned preachers like me think that things like nudity in films or strip clubs or pornography is a bad thing, but the average person has come to understand it's a good, healthy release. 
but it is not. Now, the Bible clearly says that the activity that both of these individuals were engaged in, whether you are paying the stripper or whether you are being paid as a stripper, the Bible would clearly say that that is a sin against a holy and loving God. Christ said, I did not hang on a cross for you to pay your sin penalty so that you could do that to yourself and or do that to other people. But it's much deeper than just a preacher saying, yes, sex outside of marriage, yes, sexual activity like strip clubs is a sin. It's much, much deeper than that because, again, it was obvious how incredibly emotionally unhealthy, how incredibly spiritually broken These folks were, and yet they were trying to convince themselves because society, culture, modern entertainment is trying to convince them, even modern politicians trying to convince them that what they are doing is a natural behavior. They did not see it as a deep cry. They didn't understand that these patterns that they had developed in their life was simply a coping mechanism for pain that needed to be addressed in a healthy, not sinful way. My only point with this podcast is just to say to the Christians or honestly to the non-Christians listening to this, we need to realize how unhealthy sex and sexual related activities have become in America. And we have to say, as with all things biblical, it needs to start with me. The shows that I watch, even the channels that I subscribe to, the movies that I see, the songs that I listen to, I have to stop consuming sexually perverted content. We have to say, I'm going to stop agreeing with, participating in behavior, rowdy conversation in the locker room that promotes this distorted view of honest human sexual behavior. And here's the reasons that Christians, and again, non-Christians really, here's the reason that Christians need to do this because it is not natural. And it is not really acceptable to say that this type of behavior is harmless. This type of behavior is never harmless. It is always harmful. It's always covering up deeper issues. Christians have to be concerned with our neighbors. We have to be concerned with ourselves, our families, and our fellow church members as well. When there are deep issues, spiritual, emotional, mental issues that are being covered up, And we need to work to help those issues be addressed in healthier, longer lasting ways. And again, the more that we play along with this idea in society that these types of activities, things like this type of activity in a movie, nudity here, strip clubs there, to pretend like those things are okay or not that bad, or hey, we live in 2023 We are really saying to God and to our fellow human beings, we really don't care what happens to you. Your deep emotional and spiritual pain is not our concern. And as followers of Christ, we simply cannot do that. And so we must begin to say, let it truly start with Christians and Christian households. And let's take this idea that these types of perverted videos, activities, strip clubs are normal. And let's honestly say, no, they're not. They're coping mechanisms that are harmful. And we need in America to say, we want to lovingly stand up and roll back that idea that these things are not bad and that they're not harming people that we should love and for whom Christ gave his life on the cross. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.